Greetings, I'm Dr. Candace Harris, and this is another edition of HUAA Nation. And today we have a very, very, very uh, special guest, Dr. Ben Talton. Uh, Dr. Talton is the director of the Morna Spingarn Research Center and a professor of history at Howard University. His research and writing explores histories of the African diaspora, uh, ethnicity, and politics in Ghana and the intersection of African and African-American politics and popular culture in the 20th century. He has taught at Temple University, Hofstra University, and the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Kumasi, Ghana, where he was a senior visiting lecturer and a scholar in residence. He is the author of three books, including his most recent, In This Land of Plenty, uh, Mickey, Leland and Africa in American Politics, which he won the 2020 Wesley Logan Prize from the American Historical Association. And I'm really excited to talk to him because he is one of my classmates and former McNair scholar at Howard University. So yes. Yes. I'm gonna say welcome Dr. Talton, but you know I'm gonna call you Ben, but welcome Dr. Talton. I've always been to you and I'm so proud of you, Candace. <laughs> you know, how are we here? What, what happened? How are moment? we here? How are we here? How let's, this let's, let's get into it. What is your Howard story? Well, my, part of my Howard story includes you. I mean, I'm on. I'm having this conversation because we were McNair scholars together back in 1995. With uh, I, my mentor was Dr. Edna Medford, former associate provost here. She also wrote my letters of recommendation, which helped me get into University of Chicago. Uh, but my Howard story, and I'm and I, listen. I'm just so happy that you invited me to have this conversation, and I'm I feel so very fortunate to be sitting here in conversation with you and in, in this position at our beloved alma mater. Uh, my Howard story begins with my father, really. Wow. Uh, my sister, and I'll make this quick because I know this is a short <laughs> podcast. We do this for like an hour. But my sister went here, and my sister had no idea about HBCUs, but my father gave her two choices, Howard and Spellman. And she came here kicking and screaming, but she, the, he brought her here on a spring day, and she was like, yo, this is home. <laughs> and she came here, and she loved it. She was queen of the yard, and I used to visit her during my spring breaks from New York. And I applied to one university in the world. My wow. Year, and that was Howard University. Yeah, my children. So you knew. I, I, I knew. <laughs> Thank God Howard knew also, because I could it could have been, a, you know, you're either a hero or a fool. Right. But I only wanted to go to one place, and I came to Howard University, and it was one of the greatest decisions of my life. And I met my lifelong friends here, and I think I'm sitting in this chair at Moreland Spingarm. I'm literally in Moreland Spingarm right now because of the choice my father made and the choice my sister made and the choice that I made. And lifelong journey has been great. Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, in that, you are at Moreland Spingarn. Um, right we, we, we laughed about this earlier, but we spent a lot of time, a lot of time. Um, in Moreland Spingarn mm -hmm. um, as undergrad. So in all of that, right? Because it's like this full circle kind of moment um, yeah. when you think about it. How would you say Howard has prepared you for your career journey? Oh, my goodness. Well, you know, when I first came here, I've been here for, I came here and came back here in January 2022. So we're a year and two months in. And when I first came back and like I would stay late because usually I'm running around doing the Ben show, giving tours and giving talks to people trying to, you know, elevate the place, trying to support the staff. And then my real work starts like 5 p.m. And I start checking mm -hmm. email and really doing the administrative work. Right. And so most people are gone. And I go in the reading room when I first came and I, the lights are off. I turn the lights on and just sit there. You know, those tables where we used to <laughs> sit. You'd be at like table two and I'm across the table three and we're working. The place is packed. And I was like, wow. This place was is it's a magical, magical space. And as the time has gone, uh, it's been as the administrative tasks increase, I, I you know, I, I see it less as it was and more of how it is now. Right. And so, like, you know, you used to look at the flagpole and say, that's where so and so was, or you walk down Fairmont and say, that's where so and so lived. But in the past year, it's been more of what it is now. And we're so fortunate to have an amazing staff here at Moreland Spingarn. And I was so proud of my 13 years at Temple University. I love Temple. I love North Philly. But there's no more special place than our beloved Howard University. And I think Moreland Spingarn is really the heartbeat of the campus. I think we put well below our, our weight class. One of the things we used to lament about as students is that there weren't more students in here working. And there weren't more students who knew about Moreland Spingarn. And that's, it's, it's a privilege to have that as my job now, 
to have to sell more than spin garden to promote what it is and to help elevate it and we we when i came we had a staff of seven now we're about 25. we have the support of the logan family foundation for the black press archive we were just awarded a mellon grant to add five more staff members to our team four archivists and one audiovisual librarian we have 12 undergraduate interns in here wow. bringing great life into this space and yeah. we have four undergraduate interns with the black press archive so it's just it's just it's, it's amazing it's amazing I, I i it's a job i i should whisper this but i'm going to say it out loud if i could do it for free i would do it for free don't say that i know <laughs> i'm so glad you pay me well <laughs> do it but it's just it's it's exciting i'm just it's great to be part of a it's like not only when alma mater calls you have to respond Mm -hmm. But with our politics, you know, when we say we support black institutions, we love black people. If a black institution calls you, like not only your alma mater, but your alma mater is a black institution. If you don't respond, then my politics have been sort of just for show. It's been performative. And so I was so grateful that alma mater called and alma mater is a black institution. And so I'm, and I'm here and it's, it's been an amazing year. Awesome. Awesome. And, you know, I think I was thinking as you were talking that we take for granted, right, because we were uh, McNair scholars and right. they made sure we really understood the, first, the importance. The first, the first cohort. We were the first. <laughs> the first ones. Um, we understand the importance of, of more than Van Garden. We know and probably even to some extent maybe take advantage of, of what more than spin going in. So can you just as a director, you've kind of gotten into it, but can you really talk about the significance of, um, you know, more than spin going as the center of the largest and most comprehensive repository of, you know, the black global experience? Bam, that's what it is. <laughs> you said it. And so that's one of my challenges. And also it's it's a blessing to constantly have to explain what Marlon Spingarn is. And you said it. We are the largest privately owned. And it's important to say privately owned. Privately owned. Call it. We're the largest privately owned repository of books, archives, ephemera on the global, global black experience in the world. Wow. That's it. Right. And so we are the university's archive. So the papers from all the academic units, athletic departments, teams, president office, board of trustees, provost office, et cetera, et cetera. They come here. Mm. And uh, uh, Sonia Woods, who's the university archivist, she completed was soon to be completing with her team processing the papers of Mordecai Johnson, who is the first African-American president of Howard University and one of the most sought after or uh, speakers of the mid 20th century, mm -hmm. mentor to Martin Luther King, graduate of Morehouse College. In fact, this year, I believe is, is it this year or is it neighborhood? So our first two presidents were Morehouse. I may be getting it wrong, but they're both Morehouse men. So uh, she, she's close to completing processing his papers. Our second African-American president, also one of the architects of the Brown v. Board case, which was designed in the browsing room, not too far from my office right here, our second African-American president, uh, uh, James Nabret. So those two are the first two presidential papers to be completed, and she's overseeing, overseeing that. So we're the University of Archive. We're also the manuscript division, which is the largest collection of individ individual and organizational papers. So we have papers of uh, Jack and Jill of America. And again, that's important that we're an wow. African-American owned repository, right? Because we live that experience. I wasn't Jack and Jill, but I appreciate Jack and Jill. I used to go to their parties as a high school student. <laughs> we understand the importance of a Jack and Jill, right? Whether you are a member or, or not, it's a very, very important institution in, in Black America. We also own the Kwame Nkrumah papers, the largest collection of Kwame Nkrumah. Wow. Yeah. So if you're, if you're studying Ghana in mid 20th century. We're one of the most important places for that. We are in the early stages of a partnership with the Tabo and Becky Institute to digitize and make publicly available these papers online. Because it's a shame that if you're in Ghana, the best place to study Kwame Nkrumah is at Howard University. Wow. And we don't want to just, you know, boast about that and flex and say we have the Kwame Nkrumah papers. We want to make those accessible to students and professors in the public in Ghana, but also all over Africa, because Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah was not just a national figure. He was a Pan-Africanist. Mm. So it'd be a shame if we just hold on to them for ourselves and make it so that if you're in Ghana, you have to come to Washington, D.C., which is probably economically prohibitive for you, or if you're anywhere else in the continent or in the United States, for that matter. So we want to make those publicly available. We have many of the papers of the Divine Nine. We have the Congressional Black Caucus papers, 
Uh, we have the Charles Diggs, founder of the Congressional Black Caucus and one of the founders of Trans Africa. We also have the Trans Africa Papers, which mm -hmm. is the foremost institution for the anti-apartheid movement, largest and most important African American foreign lobbying firm, and on and on and on. Eslanda uh, Robeson, right. Paul Wilson, right? So we have that, but we also are the largest privately owned library of the global black experience. We have books in every language that black folks speak, mm. including French and German and Tswana and Zulu and C French Haitian Creole. We have those upstairs on the fourth stack. And we are also the university's uh, museum. And we have the mu university museum right next door to my office where Dr. Amy Yaboa of African-American studies has an amazing uh, exhibit, Hello Black World, is Du Bois in 3D. But we're also the Black, Black Press Archive. It's the largest, most comprehensive collection of global Black newspapers. And we have a $3.6 million project to digitize all of those papers and make 60% of those available to the public. No paywall, no JSTOR, no ProQuest, no login, free and accessible to the public. Because again, it's about democracy of access. And that's what we're about, creating access to everyone in the world to their history as we right. are curating it. Wow. You said a mouthful. I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, no, it's no, seriously. Like when you really think about that and it's so interesting that you said that, because I remember feeling like even now, I mean, even founders, it's like, it's just something like when I go in there, I'm like, I'm with the ancestors. Like I'm, I'm I here. Like the, and I feel like that in founders, not to cut you off, but like, don't you feel like when you're walking across the yard, it's like Zora Neale Hurston founded our studio. Right, and exactly. And exactly. she walked this path. Elaine Locke, right? That we have a hall named after him. Right. But he was here. He I mean, I felt like I felt like I couldn't help but work hard. Right. Because the talented tenth, you know, this this notion of being a part of the, you know, of just not even, you know, not to sound elitist, but just black intellectualism. Right. right. And just the the whole notion of, you know, creating and right. being of impact and being moving with purpose. And so it's right. something about even, you know, you go in the undergraduate library, which is now very beautiful. I it is, all, it amazing. is amazing. If it anyone packed. has not gone, it they packed. need to go. You, it will blow your mind. But it's something about when you're in founders. It's like I'm in here with the, you know, the, these howl halls, these uh uh, that you know, not want to say ghosts because now that's a little scary. But no, with the scary. with the ghost, you know, of all these individuals who were in this building and who were sitting here, and you know, changing, you know, the the world, right? And so even when we talk about someone like you, who I, you know, I definitely believe represents black excellence, black intellectualism, we don't see ourselves that way. But when we're in there, it's like, wow, you know. Somebody was sitting here at this table and they were really like writing, you know, something that was about to change, you know, and impact the, the, the world. So totally agree. And I posed this question. You were there when we, we one of our first events last year was to welcome ta back to the Mecca. And I said that to him. He kind of rejected it. I was like, yeah, he did. Yeah, he, did. <laughs> he did. I was saying. You are those people now, but it's different that you're here and they're reading you. Right. And he kind of didn't. He was like, no, I'm just grateful to be here. I was like, yeah, no. he's humble. You know, a lot of humility there. A lot of humility there. But I'll say one of the things that makes me appreciate every single thing you say and agree with it is that we have I, I, I told you we have 12 interns in here in the on the on the Moreland Spingarn side. We have four additional ones down the Black Press Archive. But we, I listen to them have conversations and they speak about me as if I'm sort of part of this higher echelon of intellect, <laughs> of, of the, you know, kind of black intellect and scholarship. And to me, I'm just here trying, you know, I'm just trying to, you know, get the work done. <laughs> and sometimes when I'm speaking, I see how they're looking at me mm -hmm. and I get a little emotional. I'm like, yo, that, that was me, you know? Right. Right. That was me with reverence of this space, appreciative of the history, and also where we were, you and I were so grateful to our faculty, our mm -hmm. professors and our mentors. And I forget, oh snap, I'm I'm in that position now. I'm them. I'm them. <laughs> How did that happen? But our students are the, the best thing. Well, we have our history is the best right. thing of Howard and our students. Absolutely. And one of the things I'm most proud of is helping to bring 
the next generation of students into Moreland Spingard to help to experience what we experienced, you know? Who knows what they're gonna, they're all amazing. They're gonna become something fa fabulous or they're just gonna go live their lives. But to expose them to this space so that as they walk these paths of Zora Neale Hurston, walk these paths of E. Franklin Frazier, Ralph Bunch, Felicia Rashad, they, they understand that context. Context is everything. You're right. right. So I have one intern who's just going through the Amiri Baraka collection. He's just going through Amiri Baraka's. His job is to read Amiri Baraka's papers wow. every day. He goes through it and he loves it. Wow. And so when he steps outside of the doors of founders, he has imagine? a different perspective. I, I wish I had that job when I was. I mean, I, I think about this and, and, and it happened when we were there too, right? And, and, you know, I'll go to my next question. But, you know, can you imagine that you're a student in fine arts? And you're like just interacting with, you know, Dean Rashad, like just like really like she is <laughs> absolutely amazing. And just to see that and I and I kind of liken it to when we were there, um, uh, Al Freeman was right, right. there right. and he you know came into the lunch hall one day. And this was like, you know, shortly after Malcolm X had came out and everything. And then, of course, I watched Sesame Street, but I digress. And just to see him come in and everybody, and it's like, he's yeah, here. It's like, it's like when I go to, <laughs> well, Sankofa is a cafe across the road on Georgia right. Avenue. And I go there all the time. And you know, I consider it the second student center plus uh, faculty uh, lounge. Mm -hmm. And Holly Green is just walking around. Right. It's crazy. It's just normal. <laughs> I was like, going to fine arts one day, and and I don't usually get starstruck because I'm from New York. But walk down the hall, I walk into the administration office in, in fine arts, and she's actually literally there, sitting there doing work. Like she's she's not the show dean, right? No, she's not. She's there, and she's interacting with the students, and she's talking to them. And it's just like I would, I probably, I mean, I guess at some point you get over it, but it just seems like wow, it's fantastic. I mean, can you imagine? She waved me in. I'm standing there in the door. I was giving a tour to somebody. She waved me in. We started having this conversation. And she was she wants to engage. She's taking a serious. But at the same time, you know, Tanahasi comes to my office. Absolutely. And Nicole Hannah Jones can walk down and we have that. And yeah. we have amazing people like Candace Harris, who's out there oh, doing, you know, thank you. Hard thank to you. paint in California. And <laughs> Camilla Forbes and Susan Kelechi Watson and Greg Reed. We have amazing people who we went to school with right. who are now doing great things that we just see as our former classmates. But people, I walked down, I walk, it's horrible walking across this campus with Tanasi. Right. It's horrible because he gets stopped all the time, but he uh, he's such a humble guy. As you oh, he see. is. He very but much he is. He loves the students. So he's going to sit and take selfies, which he normally wouldn't do otherwise if we're in New York. But here he loves this campus and loves these students so much that he gives them his time. He's so generous with his time. And they see him as this larger than life person, but he's really right. just, he's just this humble guy from Baltimore. And one day those interns are going to be talking about you and that well, same, you know, they're probably already doing it, but. One know. day these interns are going to be doing amazing <laughs> things and walking across. And they're the going to say, I worked with the great Dr. Ben Dr. Benjamin Talton in the Moreland Spingarn Library. Even he's the very least, that. that second part is the most important part, is that I worked in the Moreland Spingarn Library as an MSLC scholar. Which I'm very Absolutely. And, and on that, because, you you know, you are a historian, a scholar, you, you know, are a wealth of knowledge. Um, you know, it's getting late. We are closing out late in the month, um, Women's History Month. And so, you know, who are some of, you know, the influential women leaders, you know, in your life or women that we should be more aware of or aware of their works? Yeah, so I'm so grateful to be in partnership with the Department of African American Studies and have Dr. Amy Yaboa, who is more than a friend of Moreland Spingarn or MSRC, as we say. She has a phenomenal exhibit in the in the Moreland Spingarn space between founders and undergrad. We turned it into a little gallery, and she has an exhibit on Lucy Dick Slow, mm. who is someone everyone should know. She was the first African American dean at any university in the country, just so happened to be wow. at Howard University. She was Dean of Women here. She was also a professional tennis player. She was also the first, she was the founding president of AKA, Sorority Incorporated. And so we highlight her life in that space. All the, and I'm not even doing justice to all the things mm -hmm. that, that she did, 
So I draw inspiration from Lucy Dixlow all the time. And as Dr. A, we call her Dr. A, uh, Amy Yaboa says, there are so many, Moreland Springer, the archive is filled with women's stories. And she pulled Lucy Dixlow out to tell her story. But there are thousands of women who were professors at Howard, who were students at Howard, who were doctors at Howard, whose stories are waiting to be told. And Lucy Dixlow is one. But I also highlight Dr. Edna Medford. I yes, mean, yes. Oh. The time she took with us as students, I would give her writing samples for grad school. They'd come back like it was a crime scene. There was so much red on them. <laughs> but so one thing she massacre. helped, uh, it was a massacre, but she helped make me a better writer. Mm -hmm. And she also taught me to take criticism. Yeah. I went to the University of Chicago and I was with these fancy students from Harvard and Yale who knew how smart they were but they would get a paperback and they would not be able to look at it and reflect upon the criticism and make the paper better. Right. Dr. Medford taught me how to take criticism, which made me a better writer, as I said, but also made me a good editor. Mm. Also made me a good listener. Wow. Also made me humble. Like to have your papers destroyed like that. <laughs> Howard <laughs> will humble you. <laughs> it will humble you, but also you gotta come back a week later with a revised version. Right. And it's going to have a little less red, but it's going to have red, you know? And so when I got to Chicago and I'm submitting papers, I was like, I'm ready. Like, I'm ready for the criticism. So I'm so, so grateful for Dr. Edda Medford. Uh, there are so, I, there's just so many. Dr. Haywood, who was in the history department, was amazing. But even beyond Howard, in terms of leadership, as I is move into administration, Sherilyn Eiffel of the League mm. of the is a model of excellence in leadership. Like, I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna remake this 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 space, and it's a she has a she has this way of, she speaks like I wish I wrote as well as she speaks extemporaneously, right? But it's just in terms of putting your head down and just doing the work. I'm not here for your praise, I'm not here for your thanks. I'll take it. I'm here to do the work, because this is a legacy institution. I'm gonna leave it better than I found it, right. and that model to say I'm coming in here when I leave here. Is going to be better than I found it. And my staff is going to grow. They're going to grow with me. And it's also about not having all the answers, right? She's going to figure things out. I don't have all the answers. I'm going to figure them out. And I'm going to right. make you better for being with me. And so Cheryl and Eiffel and my wife, uh, Jane, Janae Nel Nelson, is, has, has the good fortune of having inherited this institution from Cheryl and Eiffel as president and director of counsel of the NAAC Legal Defense Fund. Wow. But... The fact that she has the wake of Sherilyn Eiffel has made her job, I would say, easier. She might roll her eyes and say, I don't know if it's easier because that's a tough act <laughs> to follow, right? But that model, as you, you use the word excellence, excellence in leadership. Mm -hmm. She's also a scholar, but she makes people around her better. And so just having that as a model. So there are so many women that we can celebrate 12 months a year. Like we say, 365 days of Black history at Mullen Springer, and we don't celebrate February as the one. 365 days of women's history. We, we definitely hold that up. Dorothy Porter is someone who helped make Moreland Spingarn what it is today. Uh, she predated Dr. Michael Winston before Moreland became a center when it was just the Moreland Library. Mm -hmm. And so I could go on and on and on. There are just so yeah. many. And, and so at, one, at some point we will, and I'm surrounded by phenomenal women, Sonia Woods, who's the university archivist, Lila Sue Williams, who's our uh, manuscript curator. Uh, there's so many, but Soon we'll be talking about Madam President of Howard University. I'm sure the next president is going to be a woman, so I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for that. I look forward to that. We need a woman president. It's long overdue, long overdue. Well, you know, like I said, it is Women's History Month. We talk about, you know, women leaders and, you know, what they, rep what they represent, what they bring. And, and so there is, um, you know, Reese, like I said before, you know, research has shown that women leaders are more compassionate. <laughs> They're able to, you know, work in terms of evaluating, pushing their teams in terms of professional development, uh, no, mental, emotional health, you know, health and wellness. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's, 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 it's no, definitely, totally no, you, you have given us, I mean, I'm like, oh, I need to go look that person up and look that person up. But, you know, in that, you know, you, as you were talking <clears throat> about this notion of service, right? And we know that Howard's model is truth and service. Um, and it was ingrained in us. Um, from the minute you, you know, matriculate on, on the campus, you know, I think you, we know this, but 
how have you, you know, applied that into your, your model? You're serving already, right, as director, but in other ways, how have you, uh, you know, applied that into your life? In terms of service? Uh, it's useful, useful to think about. I guess, like you said, it's so ingrained. We just want to give back. But I think as a professor, because I am first and foremost a professor, although I'm not really teaching now, I'm more of an administrator, but it's the mentoring. Mm -hmm. And I think the, one of the best ways you give back is through guidance. And so you listen to young people, you listen to students, and then you advise them and create a way, a path forward for them. And really in terms of you, you, you help them become the leaders that they will ultimately become. And so mentoring is, is a huge, huge part of it. And you not just mentor through guidance, but you model leadership. So as I guide Morland Spingarn into his next iteration, even as you say, with women as leaders, I don't want to micromanage. I'm right. not a librarian or an archivist. That's mm -hmm. not, I'm a historian. And so I let Sonia Woods, who's the university archivist, she runs her shop. And we, we counsel together, we meet together, and I help guide that, but I, I let her lead. Right. I, you know, same with Lila Sue Williams, who's, who's the curator for the manuscript division. And even Brandon Nightingale, who's the project manager for the Black Press Archive, and, and Sammy Johnson in the library. You, you, you want to model leadership. And, and one way we do that is we let leaders lead. So when yeah. I step away, whatever that is, it's not as if Morland Springer is going to have to reinvent himself because I already yeah. have created a cadre of future leaders of, of this institution. And so even if I step away now, it'll be fine for a week or two or three or however long I'm gone because we've created a team of leaders here. And it's not the Ben Talton show. It's right. not really about me. It's about yeah. Morland Springer. It's about moments, it's about the students, it's about Howard University, and it's all about black folks. We are the, the we are preserving the global legacy of the global black experience. It's not about me. I and even it. as people talk about it, I don't 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 lead with me. It lead with Moreland, lead with the students, lead with Howard. I'm just here for a time and I'm gonna be gone at some point. And what do I lead? As Sherilyn Eiffel, you know, her model. What do I find? I make it better and I step on. And I let mm. them come behind me. That's what it's about. And I want to model that for our young people. Awesome. I'm so proud of you, Ben. Okay. So our vision, um, you know, for HUAA this year is Bison Engage. And you are definitely doing that um, with the work that you're doing. Um, what should we be looking forward to from you or more than spin guard, um, you know, in the future? Wow. You know, Moving forward, we, we're pulling, we, we, you know, we love alma mater, but she's complicated. We're pulling more <laughs> into the 21st century, a lot more digital, a lot more uh, digital re resources. We are going to be more publicly engaged. I'm so proud of the International Black Writers Festival that we launched last October. It's coming back October 4th through 6th, 2023 on campus. We're going to have a whole host of some of the same writers and activists and artists engaged in conversation this coming October, but also speaker series. We have a phenomenal set of speakers coming to campus next academic year, but also thinking about, you know, what it means to be a black owned archive in the mid 20th century. What does it mean to be a non circulating library in an age when people have their books on their phone and they have mm -hmm. all the journals that they could download? Why do you come into this space? When right. you have white, predominantly white universities that have black repositories, black collections, right? Black books. So who are we? So we need to really think about why we have a black owned repository. So that's look at uh, really defining the narrative on black conservation, black history, black studies in the mid 20th century. We really have to reinvent the conversation around that, but definitely a lot more digital, a lot more public facing events. <clears throat> more collections becoming available to the public and student engagement. It's all about the students. At the, awesome. at the end of the day, it begins and ends with our students. And again, I say what makes Howard University special is its history and its students, full stop. Absolutely. Well, where, you know, in all of that, where can people find you and where can uh, they find more information about more than Spangar? So follow us on social media. We have a phenomenal social media team. I, when we tweet and we Instagram, that's not me, at Moreland HU. 
We have uh, some staff and some interns running that on, on Instagram and Twitter. We also have a newish website, msrc.howard.edu. <laughs> Go on there, explore us. Actually, one of our phenomenal interns is running our website. msrc.howard.edu is our website. You'll find information on the Black Writers Festival, on our different divisions, on our, our some of our news. But you see a lot of what's going on with Moreland. You'll see it at, at Moreland, literally at Moreland HU on Instagram and Twitter. Just Google me. I'm not important. You can Google me and you'll find <laughs> You know, but the more, more people important. buy those books now. Come on. Well, yeah, in this land and planning. <laughs> somebody said it's on now. We, your author, but very good. Thank you so much for joining us today. Like I said, I am just, I'm just beaming. Like I've been smiling the whole whole interview just because I, I know where say, we came from. Can I, stop so say, can, I stop, can I stop you and say this? I'm so sure. very proud of you, uh, Madam President. <laughs> I'm, and I'm also so grateful that we are we're together. You know, we did this. We started this dirty together 28 years ago. Wow. And here we are. You still look like it's 28 years ago. Well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it. No, thank you so fun. much, Ben, um, for sure. You know, again, Howard Excellence, it, it just it gets no better. Thank you so much. Appreciate you.